Hi, I'm Kirk Cameron, and my partner Ray Comfort and I come to you tonight not as molecular biologists or as rocket scientists, but simply as an author and an actor, and we want to do two things that fly in the face of convention. One, we'd like to show you that the existence of God can be proven 100% absolutely without the use of faith. And secondly, as a former atheist myself, an evolutionist, I want to pull back the curtain and show that the number one reason many people do not believe in God is not because of a lack of evidence, but because of a theory that many scientists today consider to be a fairy tale for grown-ups. Thanks. I want to start off by thanking ABC, Kirk and Ray, and the audience for their participation and ears in a discussion of this magnitude. The Rational Response Squad was formed to respond to irrational claims, and the most widely held irrational claim our planet faces today are those offered by religion. Ray and Kirk have agreed to offer scientific proof that God exists without invoking faith or the Bible, and we're here to respond to those claims. Proving the existence of God requires a significant amount of time, and as a result, we have decided to yield a large portion of our time to Ray and Kirk to present their evidence. In addition to debunking their claims here, we'll have a more detailed rebuttal to all of their claims set forth today on our website, rationalresponders.com. Hello, I'm Martin Bashir, and welcome to the Nightline Face-Off. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we're gathered here at Calvary Baptist Church in the heart of New York City for the very first of our Nightline debates, and we're starting at the beginning with perhaps the most fundamental question that any of us could ever ask. Does God exist? The idea for this debate came from two previous stories that aired on our broadcast. First, we featured the story of actor Kirk Cameron and his evangelist colleague Ray Comfort. They together have formed an organization called The Way of the Master. It includes a website and cable television show, all dedicated to preaching what they say is the truth of Christianity. We all have the capacity and the desire to sin. The Way of the Master is about teaching Christians how to seek and save that which is lost the way Jesus did, not sugarcoating the message, the way of the master is something I can say that I'm legitimately more excited about uh, than the years I've spent on Growing Pains. As long as we got each other. Growing Pains was one of American television's most successful sitcoms. Started in 1985, it helped ABC dominate the ratings and made Kirk Cameron a household name. He played the eldest hey, son, Mike Seaver. Yeah, I'm cute. I'm damn cute. <laughs> Kirk Cameron is now back on our screens. And, uh, Jesus said, you heard it that it was said, do not commit adultery. Right. But I say to you, Jesus said, whoever it, looks at a woman to lust after her. No, we do a little talk, sure. Oh, yeah? Are you a good person? It's street-style evangelism, and the yeah, intention is to provoke conversations by being deliberately like confrontational. Yes. So you're a lying thief? Well, I'm a lying thief, but that doesn't make me a killer or a murderer. Uh, when you witness biblically, it usually goes fine, but there is the occasional time when people get upset because you really are talking to criminals that have sinned against God about the fact that they need to repent and trust the Savior. It's not a popular message. And the fact of the matter is that I'm out here doing God's work, and God has told me that it's okay, and I know I have a place in heaven. So why don't we end this here? You say that it reminds Christians that we're in a very real fight for the souls of men and women. Look, Ying, let me tell you. Hey. Don't tell to my country. But to what extent are you provoking that reaction? Is it really the message, or is it your behavior that's provoking that adverse response? I by no means uh, am looking for trouble or looking to encourage persecution. Um, I'm motivated purely by a concern for what's going to happen to people if they die without Christ. It's simply in a word, compassion. They are unashamed evangelists. And Kirk and Ray are on our panel this evening, and we welcome them. Thank you. The second story that prompted this debate was reported by my colleague, John Berman. He featured the work of Brian Sapient and his colleague, Kelly, who described themselves as the Rational Response Squad. They are unabashed atheists, and invite people to take the blasphemy challenge on their website to deny the existence of the Holy Spirit. 
I deny God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. Complete with kitschy graphics, the group is now engaged in a project which almost seems to invite the hate. It's called the Blasphemy Challenge. I deny the existence of God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I am no longer afraid. Initially, we wanted to find a way to uh, allow atheists to come out of the closet, speak up, and we wanted to do it in such a way where we stripped the power from uh, religious institutions that instill fear into people by showing that we're not scared of this supposed unforgivable sin. Brian cites the Bible, Mark 3:29. Whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. He is guilty of an eternal sin. The Rational Response Squad is challenging people to gamble with their souls and give it a shot. And of course, since this is 2007, post it on YouTube. I deny. I deny. Definitely deny the, the existence. Deny the existence. The existence of the Holy Spirit. Of the Holy Spirit. His Holy Spirit. So, see you in hell. We welcome Brian Sapient and Kelly also to our debate today. Before we begin, a brief explanation of how things will progress. First, both sides will be able to make a presentation of their position on the question, does God exist? Then I'll ask some questions before we take questions from the audience both here and from those who've submitted their notes and queries via our website. Then both sides will have time for closing remarks before I wrap up. The Without any further ado, I'd like to invite Ray Comfort to explain why he believes God does exist. Ray? Most people believe the existence of God can't be proven. It's all a matter of faith, but I disagree. I believe God's existence can be proven absolutely scientifically without even mentioning faith. And before we do so, let's define the word scientific. It comes from a Latin word scientificus, which means producing knowledge. To prove God's existence, we could look at subjects such as entropy, cosmology, biochemistry, uh, relativity, or quantum mechanics. While they're fascinating subjects, what we want to do tonight is confine ourselves to what the Greeks called beautiful simplicity. We'll be simply producing knowledge by looking at three irrefutable evidences for God's existence. And I'd like to begin by looking at creation. I'd like to share with you a theory I have of where the Coca-Cola can may have come from. Billions of years ago, there was a massive explosion in space. No one knows what caused the explosion. It just kind of happened. It was a big bang, and from this big bang issued a huge rock. And on top of the rock was found this brown, sweet, bubbly substance. And over millions of years, aluminum crept up the side, formed itself into a lid, and then a tab. And then millions of years later, red paint and white paint fell from the sky and formed itself in the words Coca-Cola Classic, 12 fluid ounces, original formula. You say, what are you doing? You're insulting my intellect. And so I am. You know if the Coca-Cola can was made, there must be a maker. If it's designed, there must be a designer. To believe this happened by sheer chance is to move into an intellectual free zone. Listen to what two of the greatest scientific minds in history said about the design and creation. Sir Isaac Newton. The most beautiful system of the sun, the planets, and comets could only proceed from the counsel and dominion of an intelligent and powerful being. Albert Einstein, he said, in the view of such harmony in the cosmos, which I, with my limited human mind, am able to recognize, there are yet people who say there's no God. And then he added this statement. But what makes me really angry is that they quote me to support such views. It really is very simple. Let me show you what I mean. When I look at this building, how do I know there was a builder? You can't see him, hear him, touch him, taste him, or smell him. I mean, what evidence is there there was a builder? Well, the building is absolute, 100% scientific proof there was a builder. You can't have a building without a builder. I don't need faith to believe in a builder. All I need is eyes that can see and a brain that works. You say, that's not scientific, because for something to be scientific, it must be able to be verified through repeatable testing in controlled conditions in laboratory. 
Well, this same principle works with paintings and painters. When I look at a painting, how can I know there was a painter? Well, the painting is absolute, 100% scientific proof there was a painter. You can't have a painting without a painter. I don't need faith to believe in a painter. All I need is eyes that can see and a brain that works. And as I said, you might say, well, that's not scientific. What you need is a controlled laboratory testing. It needs to be observed. Okay, we could put a dozen scientists in a laboratory and tell them to observe this painting. And I'm sure after a while they would come to the conclusion that there was a painter that painted the painting. We could repeat the experiment again and again, and they obviously come to the same conclusion. Why? Because the painting is absolute observable proof there was a painter. And exactly the same applies with the existence of God. How do we know God exists? You can't see him, hear him, touch him, taste him, or smell him. Well, creation is 100% scientific proof there was a creator. You cannot have a creation without a creator. You don't need faith to believe in a creator. All you need is eyes that can see and a brain that works. Could I ever convince you that my car had no maker? I say, hey, do you like my new car? And you say, what a beautiful car. What make is it? I say, oh, it didn't have a make. It fell together at the back of our yard. took millions of years. You say, come on, what make is it? You see, you can see it's been made with purpose in mind. It has a windshield for you to look out of to see where you're going. It has windshield wipers to keep the windshield clean. It has little squirters to keep things lubricated. And look at the human body. You have a windshield to see where you're going. This windshield, these eyes that we take for granted, have 137 million light-sensitive cells. The focusing muscles in the eye move an estimated 100,000 times a day. Man has never invented a camera lens anywhere near as intricate as the human eye. You have windshield wipers that don't go and get on your nerves. They go so fast you don't see it happen. Yours have worked irrespective of your will, probably 40 times since I began speaking. You've got little squirters in here to keep things lubricated. We call them tear ducts. Or think of this air conditioner we've got, called the nose. has a backup system in case this gets blocked through the mouth. Or think of the design of the human ear. Look where they're positioned on my head to capture sound. They've even got little grooves to feed the sound down into the brain, that incredibly complex computer system. Or consider the marvel of the human hand, the respiratory system, the nervous system, or the complex reproductive system and the entire animal kingdom, both male and female. So just as I don't need faith to believe in a builder because I have the building, building as evidence, I don't need faith to believe in a creator because I have this incredible, marvelous creation of evidence. All I need is eyes that can see and a brain that works. The invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made. Now, if I want the builder to do something for me, then I need to have faith in him. And the same applies with God. If I want God to do something for me, then I need to have faith in him. He that comes to God must first believe that he is or that he exists and he's the rewarder of those that diligently seek him, for without faith it is impossible to please him. So there is a difference between an intellectual belief in God's existence and putting your trust in him, your faith in him. So how does an atheist deal with such rational logic? Why, what he does is he becomes unreasonable and puts himself above it and says, ah, oh, that's just painting painter, it's beneath me. He puts himself on an intellectual pedestal. Which brings me to my second evidence of God's existence. Something that God has put within each of us. The conscience. Now the conscience is the impartial judge on the courtroom of the mind. It speaks to us irrespective of our will, whether we believe in God or not. It can be so powerful, it's driven men to suicide. Now human beings are unique in that we're moral creatures. We're made in the image of God. And that's what separates us from the animals. We have a distinctive knowledge of right and wrong. So we set up court systems to punish wrongdoing. Animals don't do that. The word conscience actually comes from two words. Con with science knowledge. Conscience means with knowledge. And each of us have this inbuilt knowledge that it's wrong to lie, to steal, to commit adultery, to murder. But the problem is our conscience is seared. That means it's lost its life on the outside. And what we need to make that conscience come back to life is the Ten Commandments. Now, the Ten Commandments 
are like a mirror. When you and I got up this morning, one of the first things we did was go to the mirror. Why did we do that? We wanted to see what damage had been done during the night. And all the mirror does is reflect what we are in truth, so we can get things fixed up before we go public. So what we're going to do is look at the mirror of the Ten Commandments just for a few moments to see our reflection of our state before God. Now, it's not going to be a pretty sight. It's like that mirror first thing in the morning. You may want to look away from the mirror or even smash the mirror, but please be patient with me because what I'm going to do is most necessary in presenting my case for God's existence. My aim is simply to stir your conscience so it will do its God-given duty. If you harden your heart, you won't hear its voice. So here we go. We're going to look at some of the commandments, so get ready. Have you ever told a lie? Have you broken that commandment? I'm not talking about discretion. And where grandma's 115, and he said, Grandma, you look just gorgeous. I'm not talking about discretion. I'm talking about a bold-faced lie. Have you ever lied? So if you've lied, what does it make you? It makes you a liar. Another commandment, you shall not steal. Have you ever stolen something? Irrespective of its value. If you've taken something that belongs to someone else, then you're a thief. Here's another commandment. You shall not take God's name in vain. Have you ever used God's name in vain? Have you ever used God's name as a cuss word to express disgust? Think about it. God gave you life, and you've taken his holy name and used it in what's called blasphemy, which is very serious in God's sight. Final one, and this is a heavy one. This one nailed me to the wall. Ray Comfort, thank you. Jesus said, you've heard it said by them of old, you shall not commit adultery, seventh commandment. But he said, I say to you, Whoever looks upon a woman to lust after her has committed adultery already with her in his heart. Who hasn't done that? So, okay, let's just look at it. If you've violated those four commandments, you're a self-admitted, lying, thieving, blasphemous, adulterer at heart, and you have to face God on Judgment Day whether you believe in him or not. So here it is. If God judges you by the Ten Commandments on the Day of Judgment, will you be innocent or guilty? Will you go to heaven or hell? You say, I don't believe in hell. Don't say that. That's like me walking on a freeway, having a truck coming right at me and saying, I don't believe in trucks. My unbelief doesn't negate realities. Most Americans actually believe in the existence of God. We say, yeah, there is a literal place called hell, that's reserved for Hitler and mass murderers. And it's true, God is going to punish murderers. He's good, he's just, he's going to make sure murderers get what's coming to them. But realize this, God is so good, he's also going to punish rapists, adulterers, pedophiles, fornicators, blasphemers, hypocrites, and even thieves and liars. The Bible says, all liars are their part in the lake of fire. No thief, no adulterer will inherit the kingdom of God. So hopefully, your conscience has been stirred by the commandments to show you you need God's forgiveness, which brings me to the third evidence. This is the radical nature of conversion. Here's the essence of what I'm saying. If you realize you need God's forgiveness and you seek his forgiveness through the gospel, God himself will reveal himself to you. That is the ultimate proof. Again, please be patient with me. This sounds kind of preachy, but if you don't understand the gospel, you won't respond to the gospel, which is the greatest proof you could ever have. You and I are part of the ultimate statistic, 10 out of 10 die. Now there's something in you and I that says, oh, I don't want to die. That's your God-given will to live. Listen to it. Because God, the judge of the universe, has proclaimed the death sentence upon the entire human race, the soul that sins that shall die. But the same God is rich in mercy. And the Bible says he sent his son to suffer and die on the cross to take the punishment for our sins. We broke God's law, and Jesus paid our fine. Then he rose from the dead, defeated death, and now God offers everlasting life to all those who repent and trust the Savior. You know the Bible verse. Who, do, who in America doesn't know this? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes on him should not perish but have everlasting life. If there was one chance in a million that that's true, the offers everlasting life to all of humanity, you owe it to your good sense just to soften your heart and look into it. You've got 30 seconds, Ray. What we're told to do to receive everlasting life is to repent and trust the Savior. It's as simple as that. All you have to do to have the ultimate proof is cry out, God, I've violated your commandments. I've sinned against you. Jesus Christ died for me, rose again on the third day, and put your trust in him as you trust a parachute, and you'll get the shock of your life. It happened to me 35 years ago, and I'm still shaking my head at the radical nature of conversion. So there's those three 
evidences of God's existence. Creation produces knowledge of a creator. Conscience produces the knowledge of the need of his forgiveness. And conversion produces a knowledge of God experientially. Thank you. Thank you. Now we turn to the opposite side of the argument. Brian Sapient and Kelly will tell us why they don't believe that God exists. Brian. Thank you, Martin. Um, actually, just to make a brief correction, I'm not here to tell you why I don't believe God exists. I'm here to tell you why I believe he failed at his premise to prove that God exists scientifically without invoking the Bible. Um, most of us know that Ten Commandments are in the Bible, so we probably should leave the building right now. The Ten Commandments were used wholly here as part of his proof. However, he brings up some points. He says that we see this building, we know there was a builder. We see a painting, we know there was a painter. Uh, he forgets that um, we can call the builder of this church. We can check New York City permit records. We can't call God to go visit his universe factory. We can call the painter. We can call the paint maker. We can go to the car factory, but can Ray take us to God's factory to watch creation in action? Ray also talks about how, um, and this is, seriously, I wasn't even going to touch on the Bible at all. Um, I wanted to be all science today. But he mentions that pedophiles and murderers and Hitler are all going to go to hell. However, um, as you may all well know from the blasphemy challenge, Jesus said all sins should be forgiven of man except blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. So pedophiles, murderers, as long as you're Christian in prison, you can feel safe. If you truly believe this, and it's true, you will go to heaven. Now let me address the arguments that I was expecting from Ray, which he did bring up points of. Um, he claims all creations must have a creator. Um, there's just a huge gaping hole in this argument. It's, it's so obvious, it really doesn't warrant an answer. But most simply, simply put, if all creations need a creator, then what created God? And was that God's God, and was that God's God's God? Just... You know, anti-scientists like Ray make claims of intelligent design, yet everywhere we look, we see the evidence of a system that wasn't intelligently designed. I have nipples and mammary glands. We have a blind spot in the human eye, which he thinks is perfect, but yet the image is sent to our brain backwards. Our ecosystem depends on life, killing life, in order to survive. Snakes have legs that they don't use, which is a remnant of their evolutionary past and proof that they weren't designed intelligently. What contribution to mankind has religion delivered in the same time frame where science has contributed immeasurably? And is any contribution even remotely comparable? What contribution has religion given that atheists can't or haven't given? Atheists have given blood, donated money without threats of hell to the beneficiaries, fed the starving, built houses, and innumerable other acts of goodwill. Now, while I may seem harsh today, I assure you that outside of this setting, I, like most other atheists, are good and compassionate people. One doesn't need religion to be a good person, and religion doesn't make somebody a good person. Atheists are your doctors, teachers, firefighters, policemen, and war heroes. And if you're familiar with Ray's arguments, we have to deal with being told that we don't even exist. Atheism is merely the absence of belief in any god. We are all born as atheists. We must be taught to be theists. And as an agnostic atheist, I am not making an absolute claim that no god exists. I am making an absolute claim that today I don't have a belief in one. And I'm sorry that Ray's arguments didn't help change my mind. And I'll now turn the time over to my partner, Kelly, who will address these a little more scientifically and philosophically. Hi there. I would just like to reiterate that our purpose here is solely to show that Ray and Kirk cannot prove their God, the God of Christianity, using scientific methods. We are atheists. Atheism is a lack of a belief. So I'd just like to remind all of you that you are atheists, just like Ray and Kirk are when it comes to Zeus, Apollo, Thor, or any other of the countless imaginary people that we've come up with throughout human history. So, the best evidence that Ray's God doesn't exist 
is the refutation of his claims. So we're going to start out with the definition of science. Science is the testing of explanations against the natural world. Science is transparent, which means that anybody can look up these tests, they can read about the methods and the results for themselves if they're so inclined. Nobody's hiding this. The real beauty of science is that it's revisable. Science is continually changing with the addition of new information, unlike dogmatic belief, which doesn't. Scientific experiments use two different forms of methodology. First is direct. A direct experiment would be something like what you see on a TV infomercial when they want to prove that their product is better than another one. The other method of experimentation is indirect. It follows a line of questioning similar to if this thing is true, then one would expect to find this thing out there existing in nature or would expect to not find this other thing. This is the category of experimentation that evolution fits into. Intelligent design is not science precisely because it is impossible to test it in that way. God exists outside of the natural world, not to mention the fact that an omnipotent creator who could do anything would negate science completely. We would live in a world of magic where you could turn on the light switch and, well, maybe it'll turn on and maybe it won't because, hey, it's magic. So unless Ray can prove how his God created the universe, take us to the universe factory, show us his methods and explain them to us, it simply is not science. Ray uses creation to support his God. First of all, the question is phrased to solely support Ray's God concept. The reality is that an ultimate creator is no more likely to be Yahweh than the flying spaghetti monster. <laughs> the perfection of the universe. I mean, it's a completely ridiculous statement because we wouldn't be here to observe it if it were otherwise. That's not proof of any kind of creator. It's just proof that it is. Ray claims that God is the first cause. God is exempt from ordinary logic and rational existence as we know it. How convenient! Again, magic can be used to explain, <clears throat> excuse me, anything, absolutely anything. So right off the bat, not only does Ray's God hypothesis fail to meet the standards of science, his whole basis for belief in his God is really exposed for the intellectual dishonesty that it is. Ray's next argument relied on the conscience. If we're all made with this inbuilt conscience, why do parents bother to teach their children anything? Wouldn't they just know? What about sociopaths and murderers? God forgot to install their consciences? The fact is that conscience and morality are the result of thousands of generations of <clears throat> parents and societies passing these teachings on to their children. This is necessary not only for society to function, but also for successful gene proliferation. The apparent similarities throughout time can be simply explained by the fact that all humans seek pleasure and avoid pain. The presence of immoral people no more proves the need for raise God than the you know, existence of Ted Haggard disproves his God. <laughs> Ray spent a good deal of time on the Ten Commandments from the Bible that we weren't supposed to be discussing tonight. What he's doing here is trying to manufacture a problem which only his God can fix. Well, the first question I would ask is, well, which version of the Ten Commandments are we using anyway? We've got Exodus 20, Exodus 34, Deuteronomy 5. We're going to have to settle on which version we're going to even talk about first. The first three or four of the commandments, depending on the version, are just all about worshiping God. So 
If these laws are all written on our hearts, explain the abundance of other religions where people worshipped other gods before Yahweh if we all knew that that's what we were supposed to be doing anyway. And while we're on the subject of other religions, what about like the five pillars of Islam? Brian and Kelly, thank you. Does that law prove that Allah exists? What about all the other laws of the Bible? There's a ton of other laws right there in that same book. Do you feel bad if you eat pork or wear a polyester blend? Do we need forgiveness for that? Ray also claims that, you know, his God is the moral lawgiver. Why is it that morality requires some kind of ultimate source? What about other qualities that society has deemed to be beneficial? Like democracy. Ray might as well say that democracy requires an ultimate source, and it's Captain America. <laughs> the fact is, is that God's courtroom is no more real or binding <clears throat> than the courtroom in Wonderland. The real insult here, though, is that in Ray's world, morality itself is obsolete. The only thing that matters is faith. Hitler, who was a Catholic, despite what everybody else wants to tell you, can go to heaven because he believed in Jesus. But the six million unrepentant Jews that he murdered, they get to go to hell. That's a nice guy, that God. <laughs> He uses your personal experience. First, like that, it's not verifiable, it's not reproducible, and the only thing that it proves is the existence of your own brain. So I've shown their beliefs not scientific. Creation doesn't demand a creator. They use guilt and dishonesty to try to force you into a position where you need their God. And there are way more better arguments for the development of morality than God did it. So I hope that everybody can leave here today with a better understanding of that kind of trickery and appeal to emotion. Brian and Kelly, thank you. I'm now going to give the floor to Kurt for just a couple of minutes before we come to some questions. Kurt. Thank you. <clears throat> well, let me start by saying that I really feel a bit of kinship with Brian and Kelly. I understand where they're coming from. I used to think just like they think. I used to be an atheist. I believed what they believed, and I blindly believed what my science teachers told me in school because I figured, well, they were a lot smarter than I was, so what they say must be true. There wouldn't be a hidden agenda there. I had faith in what they said. But the problem was I never really took the time to look into the evidence myself, do the research, and actually see if the claims that they were making were true. You see, when I was on Growing Pains, I was 17 years old. I was at the height of the success of the show, and I had the world by the tail. I was making lots of cash. I was really famous. I was doing everything I wanted. There was nothing that was holding me back. I had everything. I did not need God. There was no uh, motivation for me to want to believe in any kind of a fairy tale. But I was highly interested in the subject because I knew that 10 out of 10 people die. And I knew that one day I would die and I would find out the truth about whether or not there was a God. And I wondered about this. And so I decided if there was a God who had given me my life and everything I held dear to me. And all I had given him was my rebellion, my attitude, my sarcasm, and my unbelief. All of my money and fame and popularity that impressed others wouldn't help me one bit on that day. And I decided I wanted to get to the bottom of the issue. And so I started researching it. I started checking out the evidence. I put my own career at risk. My only motivation was to want to know the truth. So one day I was in my sports car, pulled off to the side of the road, and I said, God, if you're there, I, I want to know. I've never prayed before. If you're real, please show me. I don't want to believe in a fairy tale. I don't want to commit intellectual suicide, but I want to know the truth. 
and I opened my eyes. It wasn't like I saw a vision. I didn't hear voices. Jesus wasn't on the windshield. The Holy Spirit didn't rush in through the air conditioning vents and blow my hair back. But I had this sense that something had clearly changed in my attitude and I had humbled myself before the possibility of an all-powerful God who perhaps created me. And there was a change in my heart. I began reading the Bible. The Bible, which was once dead letter to me, made no sense to me, came to life and spoke to me in an extremely powerful way. I began going to church, learning more about this God of the Bible. God began transforming me on the inside. I began to love the God I once mocked in sarcasm. And I began to really despise and hate the sin that I once loved and enjoyed so much. This wasn't a change I was trying to produce in myself. And as I began to study more deeply the issues of science and history and the Bible and look into the questions and objections that you're hearing today, I found that all the evidence points to support my decision to trust and believe in the living God. Before this debate, Brian and I had a chance to talk on the phone. I called and we just talked about a couple of details and I ended the phone conversation by saying, Brian, don't worry about anything. I'll be praying for you. And Brian laughed and <laughs> Brian said, that's it, Kurt. You pray for me, I'll think for you. <laughs> and I thought, I said, you know what? He's right on, right on, man. Think, that's a really good idea today. Think carefully, this is so important. Please don't look at this as simply a debate to see who's gonna win a, 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 a theological discussion here. Look at this as an opportunity to help you make a personal decision about what you will believe about God. Because when you personalize this, realizing that one day you too will die and find out if what Ray and I are saying is the gospel truth, suddenly the stakes could not be higher. Kirk, you're running out of time, so I need you just to wrap up. This is simply a wake-up call. Don't sit on the sidelines. You have stakes in this debate. What you believe about God will determine where you spend eternity. So think and listen carefully. Thank you very much. You made a number of claims based on creation, conscience, and personal conversion. And you relied on the Bible to some extent for some of those. You were using the Ten Commandments. But Kelly makes the point Will you take us to the universe factory, i.e., who created God? If God created all of this, and you said a picture doesn't emerge without there being a painter, well then who created God? Okay, I'd like to address that. It's a great question. But before I do, I'd like to respond to a couple of very important things Kelly said, firstly about Jews uh, not going to heaven. The first 3,000 Christians were Jews, if you read the book of Acts. I'm Jewish, so the gospel is open to Jew and Gentile. And the second one is the question you're asking, who made God? It's got a very simple answer. God is eternal. He is outside of the realm of time. Time is a dimension God created and subjected man to. You and I are bound by time. And because we're in time, logic demands everything must have a beginning and an end. That's how we think, because we're in time. But God dwells in eternity, outside of that dimension, where there's neither beginning nor end. When the, we the, problem, the problem, though, Ray, with that argument is that you were proposing the notion that there is no picture without a painter. You were the one who was proposing the notion there's no creation without a creator. Yet now you're using time and chronology to somehow get out of the fact that we need to know who created the creator. That's what they're asking. That's what I'm, that's what I'm answering. God dwells in eternity where there is neither beginning nor end. That's why when Moses said to God, what's your name? He said, I am. God is. There's neither past nor present with God. He is in eternity. And when you and I die, we will move out of time into eternity. And there are things we believe in. A space has no beginning and no end. We accept that by faith. You can go a billion miles that way and a billion miles that way, and there's not a brick wall that says that end. So just as we receive that by faith, we just have to trust there's no beginning and end to space. So God is eternal. He dwells outside of dimension. We're in. He dwells in eternity. Kelly made the point about the multiplicity of religions. If you were born in Pakistan, 
you might well call your faith Islam. If you were born in India, you might well call your faith Hinduism. The argument goes that your God is in fact a projection of your personal culture. And that's why there are all these different religions around the world. And what that means is that the existence of God is a projection by you from your Western culture of Christianity. But equally, I could take you to Lahore in Pakistan, where people there project Islam as being their God. That doesn't prove the existence of God. What that proves, as, as one author, Michael Onfre, has said in his book, The Atheist Manifesto, he says, atheism is not therapy, but restored mental health, because claiming the existence of God is a mental delusion. Thank you. <laughs> the existence of God, God exists, but being a Christian is not a cultural thing. Um, being a Christian is being converted by God himself. And it doesn't matter where you are, whether you're in Pakistan, Timbuktu, Moscow, if you hear the gospel and call upon the name of God, he'll reveal himself to you. You've got God's promise wherever you, wherever you are. I, I was in New Zealand. New Zealand is not a Christian country. It is more secular. And yet I called upon him 7,000 miles from here, down under, and I came to know him. But that's not the point I'm making. The point I'm making is, and the point that Michael Onfray makes, is that you are projecting the existence of God from your cultural perspective. In other places in the world, they project a different God and a different religious faith. What it proves is that God is actually a projection. There is no existence of God beyond what you believe him to be. Well, that's, we, we've got a perception of an American God, but Christianity is not an American religion. It's from Israel. It's nothing to do with culture, the, the real and true living God. And like I said, it doesn't matter where you are, no matter what your culture is, if you break free from your culture and call upon the name of God, Kirk wants to say something I can tell. You want to when say something? Finish, please. I'm ahead. finished. Go for it. I, I think it's, um, <clears throat> perhaps this, this is, uh, w will be helpful. Projecting your own concept of God and making that a reality in your mind is a delusion, and that is called idolatry. It's called creating a false God. People do it all the time. They create a God that they're comfortable with in their minds, and they pray to that God. The one true God sets himself apart from myths and fairy tales by revealing himself to humanity. He's done that generally through creation. He's also done it through the conscience that we each have. He's done it specifically through the scriptures and most specifically through the person of Jesus Christ, who was the Son of God, was born uh, of a virgin. He died on the cross, rose from the dead, and he converts the hearts of those who repent and put their trust in him and demonstrates that he is the true God. That happens whether you're in America or Pakistan or anywhere. I understand the argument you're making. Okay. Brian, respond to what you've just heard. There's a lot right now. Um, Kirk, you know, thank you for telling us your personal experiences and bringing up our phone conversation. Um, you know, he's right, we do have some stuff in common. But all of you in this room have personal experiences. And um, maybe one of you in this room has a personal experience that ghosts live in your house. Um, the fact that you believe that doesn't make it any more true. I could have a personal experience that there's an invisible gnome on my shoulder right now. And I live it every day. And, um, you know, it's true. It doesn't make it true to reality. And so a personal experience story really has no, um, it really doesn't even deserve to be in a discussion like this. Um, you know, Kelly and I were both Christians, so we could bother you with that story, but we're not going to. Um, in relation to Ray's response to... To the specific science question. Exactly. Um, what created God? Well, God's, uh, Ray says... Uh, I called you God. Uh, <laughs> Ray says, he called me Kirk. <laughs> uh, Ray says that God exists outside of time. Um, you know, so he's created this. Basically, the argument that he gave you, he doesn't even believe. Um, you know, everything needs a creator, except for this one magical thing at the beginning of it that doesn't need a creator. Um, science has a, uh, a law, it's called uh, the third law of thermodynamics, um, which shows us, and it's one of the most tested laws in science, that matter or energy can neither be created nor destroyed. That we always have the same amount of matter and energy. We could blow up this building and while it would look completely different, there would be the exact same amount of matter and energy in the universe. 
That tells us, scientifically, if we were to use a more scientific approach, that the components of our world today, our universe, have always existed. And we have real science to lend credence to that. Knowing that, and knowing that the other side of the coin is to create something to explain it away. This is called, in logic terms, an argument from ignorance. Ray doesn't know what created the world, so he's made up a god to tell you that that is what's created the world. Um, you know, knowing that, that we have these two options. One thing that we don't have any proof for, that we just make up, and another one that we have this scientific theory, this law, actually, that's been tested over and over and over and has never been shown wrong. All signs point to the fact that the universe has just always existed and no God is needed to explain it. And if you're a philosophy buff, you would have heard of this term, Occam's razor. And Occam's razor tells us that the most simplest solution is the most plausible. And in this case, the simplest solution is no God. Okay, Brian, do you either of want to respond to what he just said? No. <laughs> you you, you don't want to respond? No. Kirk, do you have anything to say? Um, no. I, I, I I think pe people can figure it out. But, but, but Brian's point that you've, uh, you have this philosophy about having a creator, but it breaks down at the point at which you talk about God. And that that's fundamentally inconsistent with the argument that you're making. If you're going to keep going back to the beginning, you've got to go back all the way and say something's got to be in infinite. You, you keep going back and saying, what made that? What made that? The well, universe. the universe is infinite. But yeah. you're going to say, who, who made the universe? If Nothing. If God can be infinite, why can't the universe be infinite? Well, we believe that God is infinite, that he dwells in eternity, and that he's revealed the fact that he has created the universe by speaking it into existence. But why okay, can't but the universe be infinite if God can be infinite? And you were supposed to bring scientific proof that that's exactly what happened to support your belief, but we haven't seen a shred of it. We've given you... Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. We're now going to continue. Brian and Kelly, I wanted to ask you this. Dostoevsky famously said, if there is no God, everything is permitted. Okay? If in the natural world, stronger organisms eat weaker ones, the survival of the fittest, what basis would an atheist have for saying that it's wrong for stronger nations to subjugate weaker nations, or indeed it's wrong to let the poor and the weak simply starve? What, what basis do you have for saying that, that there's any reason to protect the weaker from the strong if that's the way it is? Well, like I touched on a little bit earlier when I talked about the development of morality, um, the development of morality is something that is completely necessary for societies to function. The fact is that every single person in this room is dependent on thousands of other people for the products and services and things that you rely upon every single day. People realized this. At the beginning of civilizations, it started out with small groups, families, neighborhoods, and it slowly kind of coalesced and turned into, well, now, I mean, I would hope for a global culture, a global civilization where we're all united and looking out for the best interests of all of humanity. This is, this is necessary, not just for our societies, but from an evolutionary standpoint, because if we didn't band together in that way, guess what? A lot of us wouldn't be passing our genes down very successfully. So, but you can't take morality and put it into a setting like what you're talking about, something akin to like natural selection and survival of the fittest. But when you talk about morality, I'm asking you, whose morality? Whose morality has the dominant power? Well, atheism is not necessarily total moral relativism. It's not like saying, well, I think it's okay to just run around and punch people in the face, so I'm going to do that and it's okay because there's nobody to tell me any different. No, I don't think anybody's suggesting that, but the point I'm, I'm, I'm trying to put to you is if there is no God, there is, as it were, no higher authority to establish the values that we should seek to live by, 
then what possible argument do you have against allowing the stronger to consume the weak? Well, that's a false analogy anyway, because I don't want to follow the morality of the God of the Bible who well, thinks no, it's I, I'm okay not even, to I'm murder not suggest, no, babies. So that's, I, I didn't mention <laughs> the God of the Bible. Yeah. Yeah, in terms of, you know, who's to tell us what's right and wrong, I think we all realize that if we were to go out on the streets right now and murder somebody, there are law enforcement agencies that would be out for us instantly. Our governments have enacted rules and laws, and they're not based on the Bible. They're based on what we as a society have grown to understand is important for our ultimate survival. The rules of the Bible actually came from those previously determined rules and understandings that we needed to, you know, exist. Right. Well, I just, like, you said the rules of the Bible came from something previous from, to the Ten Commandments? Yeah, people existed before the Bible, and the people who wrote the Bible thought, these are some of the rules that we've had for a long time, so let's just put them in the Bible and it'll make sense. And, and know, some of them do make sense. How do you know that? Well, you can look back in anthropology, you can kind of study the way that people have come about, and what Ray is about to do is he's about to say that I take that claim on faith. However... Okay, well, let, let, let him speak for himself. Well, Sorry. I already know what he's going to say. He's done no. this a million times. <laughs> okay. Code but, of Hammurabi, predates Old Testament, okay, just same one, laws. But just one second. I mean, get, I, I want to put to you then, Ray, the, the question, which is, if, if there is no God, what is the basis for believing that human rights should apply to there's, particular there's groups. There's no real basis. You can do what you want. If the, if the civil law allows it, if you can get a government to allow you to do it, like the, the fascist governments, then you can do it. There's no real reason. There's no ultimate justice, so you can do what you want. Which That's exactly what Christianity teaches us. You can do whatever you want and ask Jesus for forgiveness and you'll be forgiven. No, that's not true. That's, that's, that's not, I don't think that's, I don't think that's Oh, that's exactly true. true. It's in the Bible many times. You know, I, I don't think that's what they are representing, the Christian faith says. What were you going to add to that? Yeah, I was going to say that no, that that's not true. You, you cannot uh, simply live any, any old way you want, running around uh, shooting, killing people, doing whatever you want, claim that you believe in Jesus and all is forgiven. That, that's called a religious hypocrite. And uh, if you can sniff them out, uh, God certainly can. But the Bible says that you'll be forgiven for whatever you ask forgiveness for, right? No, it speaks of contrition and genuine repentance. And but, well, but, okay, but does the repentance. Bible say or not say that you will be forgiven for any sin with the exception of blaspheming the Holy Spirit? Upon your repentance and faith in Jesus Christ, not upon, but, but upon does not it if you're say a hypocrite. That? Yeah, not if yes. you're a hypocrite. Okay, yeah. so it does say that. Of course. So you, you can't sit here and say that those people are hypocrites because you don't know if their repentance has been genuine or not. That's just the easy way out of this explanation that you can't do whatever you want in Christianity and just get away with it. Kirk. Yes. In Victor Stenger's book, God the Failed Hypothesis, he says, evolution by natural ex selection is accepted as an observed fact by the great majority of biologists and scientists in related fields and is utilized in every aspect of modern science, including medicine. How do you account for the fact that evolution is now the dominant philosophical understanding for so many of the sciences? Well, that, that's a very good question, and it, it is pervasive in society. Um, I think that the, the number one reason that many people don't believe in the existence of God is because of evolution. And we've been taught that evolution is how we got here, therefore, um, because it's assumed that it's a scientific fact, therefore, God does not exist. So let's look at the theory for a moment. We start with nothing, there's an explosion, and that produces everything over billions and billions of years. The birds and the trees, the flowers, um, the moon, the sun, the stars, elephants, human beings, everything we've got. And this happens by random chance natural selection over billions of years. Now, Charles Darwin said that in order for his theory to be true, there must be millions of in-between stages, transitional forms in the fossil record. And that if within a hundred years we don't find those transitional forms that his theory should be discarded. Well, more than a hundred years has gone by and those missing links, those transitional forms, those in-between stages are still missing. They thought they found some of them. One of them was back in 1999. 
Uh, if you do the research, you'll find that a Chinese farmer glued together the head of a bird and parts of a reptile and completely fooled the worldwide scientific community, including National Geographic, with what they thought was a transitional form. It was called Archaeoraptor. Smithsonian Institution actually accused National Geographic of engaging in sensationalistic tabloid journalism. It was a hoax. Now, there is something called microevolution. This is very different. Microevolution is adaptation within a species. Look at dogs. You've got the tiny Chihuahua and the Great Dane. They're very different, but they're both dogs. Or horses. You've got zebras and donkeys. You've got the dwarf pony and the draft horse. Very different, but they're horses. Horses produce horses and dogs produce dogs. Adaptation within a species is totally different than man evolving from an entirely different species. Science has never found a genuine transitional form that is one kind of animal crossing over into another kind, either living or in the fossil record. And there's supposed to be billions of them. Now, what I'm about to show you does not exist. These were actually created by our graphic artists, but I want you to keep your, out, your eye out for this because this is what evolutionists have been searching for for hundreds of years. All right, and if you find one of these, you could become rich and famous. So here's some transitional forms. This is called the crocodile. Oh Can you see this? God, not... Crocodile and a duck. <laughs> All right, let's try another one. This is the bullfrog. <laughs> Half bull, oh a frog, or, of course, the sheepdog. <laughs> you're, you're laughing, of course. Now, some of you might be saying, wait a minute, look at the platypus. There is a mammal with hair and a, a, a bill like a duck. Well, yeah, it's a strange one, and that's exactly how God made it. And there's plenty of strange animals like that. Nature is observable proof that every animal brings forth after its own kind. No one has ever seen a horse produce an on-horse, or a bird produce anything but another bird. Even the famous fossil Archaeopteryx, said to be a reptile transitioning into a bird, if you do the research, you'll find out it has been shown to be fully bird, a perching bird. It has feathers. We even have a website. It's called intelligentdesignversusevolution.com. It offers $10,000 to anyone who can present a genuine living transitional form. Charles Darwin said, quote, I often, often a cold shudder has run through me as I've asked myself whether I may not have devoted myself to a fantasy. Time magazine, scientists can see that their most cherished theories are based on embarrassingly few fossil fragments and that huge gaps exist in the fossil record. Newsweek, the more scientists have searched for the transitional forms that lie between species, the more they've been frustrated. And scientist Ernest Chain, Nobel Prize winner for developing penicillin, said, quote, I would rather believe in fairy tales than in such wild speculation. Nature is proof, observable proof, that God made us to produce after our own kind. Man did not evolve from amoebas. Okay, hold it there. Can I, can I ask you to explain the gaps in the fossil record as just rehearsed by Kirk. Yeah, I want to start actually. Um, well, well, why don't you answer that question first? Well, the then? gaps, in the, it's actually too easy to answer. I mean, every single person in here is a transitional form. Every single fossil that has ever been found is a transitional fossil. To, to say anything otherwise so, sorry, is to show the, the person no, to on, be extremely on, ignorant about the topic of evolution let, let, me, let me just put to you, though, the argument that they were putting, which is that there is no evidence, this is what they're asserting, right. there's no evidence for a transitional creature. What I'm saying is that every single person alive, every animal that has ever lived is a transitional fossil. What, what do you mean by that? You can see... Um, but you're, you weren't, when you were born, you weren't transitioning from monkey for the first five years to human being for the next ten. Correct, correct. You However... Were, you can look back at what I transitioned from. Um, no, I'm asking... You can look at, at fossils like Australopithecus afarensis. No, I'm sure, which, but you, the argument you're making, sorry, Brian, the argument you just made was that everybody in this room is a transitional creature. And what all I'm, life is constantly evolving. And what, I'm, constantly. and what I'm asking you is, explain to the audience what they were 
when they were born, which is different to what they are now. No, that's not what I'm saying. Okay, what, what I'm saying, saying is that people evolve over time. All animals evolve over time. The claim that there have never been any transitional fossils found. I talked to the American Museum of Natural History this week. They, they were unfortunately unable to bring fossils here. Anybody can go to the exhibit. They have plenty of fossils there to show Kirk and Ray. I, I, I will get you free tickets. I'll pay for the tickets. You need to go and see the exhibits. There are plenty of transitional fossils there. Hundreds and thousands have been found. We put together, I figured you would say this because I, I know this is your stock, rationalresponders.com forward slash evolution proof. Could you give us one now, a transitional form? Just be specific. Well, you Just have one. to go look Just at one. them. You, Australopithecus afarensis. What's the transitional form from what? From a previous other ape-like creature to the, you know, what we have today. There's that, Australopithecus afarensis lived about seven million years ago. There are plenty of transitional you know fossils that, in between, because you can date it. How can it be dated? With, uh, what is it? What? Radiometric yeah, right. dating. And you believe that? Okay, okay, we're not going to get into, like, we're all believing this well, on faith. Let me, let, me, let me go back for so, one moment, because, yeah, okay. you know, you can, ex you can expose the sort of, you know, and I, I don't mean offense, Kirk, I really like you, um, <laughs> when I use the word ignorance. But um, when you say that evolution says we start with nothing, and that was how you opened your, your statement, you actually show that you have no understanding of evolution. That's actually the theory of abiogenesis. That's how all things started, okay? That's how life started on Earth. Evolution happens after we were already here, after life started. Um, you spoke about an example where the chicken head and then the Smithsonian exposed it as a fraud. That's a good example of how science works. We learn from our mistakes. Yeah, they got tricked. They figured it out. We now change that to accept what was the fact. Um, you talk about microevolution. That, that was maybe wrong and you have to scrap the theory again and come up with the next one. And it'll you happen over and one fossil out of just the hundreds of thousands that are available. You spoke about microevolution and how we have that, but not macroevolution. I'd ask you, how can you not walk a mile taking one step at a time? Microevolution is one step at a time. Macro is when you get to that end of that mile. How can you not walk a mile taking one step at well, a time? Be, be, before you do that, okay, that's your response to what they said. Can I just... Respond, Kirk, to the argument that you've just heard, which was uh, that actually evolution is, is evidenced. There is evidence, and it is accepted. The, as far as I understand from the research that I've done, the... I'm sorry, I just... I'm, uh, ask me that question again. As far as... Tell me again. Well, multiple times. Okay, thank you. Brian's position was that he heard you say that there are gaps in the fossil record. Yeah. His argument is, if you go to the American Museum of Natural History, there are fossils, and there's evidence. And second, that transition occurs over very large lengths of time. One, and a mile is accomplished by taking one step at a time. Correct. As far as I understand, any fossil that you find at your museum is a fully formed creature. There is not something in there that is halfway between one animal and halfway between another animal that you can observe to be so. Your assumption is that evolution is true from the outset. That's your presupposition, and therefore you say that you and I are transitional forms. We're constantly changing into the next thing. That's based on your presupposition that evolution is true. But the observable evidence is that you've got animals that are fully formed. You've got adaptation within a species, but you've never seen any animal produce anything other than uh, Because that's that not how evolution animal. works. You say, Hang on. that's well, not how evolution works. That over second. time, it'll turn into something else, but you've never seen it happen. No one's ever seen it happen. And that is called macroevolution. You cannot extrapolate microevolution over time and equal macroevolution. No one's ever seen it demonstrated. Okay. Let me, let me move on. We have, we have, do you want to have one go? 
just okay, one, one just second, briefly, Kelly, because right. we need to move on. Because we, okay, the reason why Kirk isn't seeing the kind of missing link that he wants to see is because mutations must necessarily be small enough to allow for the survival and reproduction of that creature. You're not going to find a half duck, half crocodile, because what would that mate with? That wouldn't be to anything's evolutionary advantage. But even if there were no fossils, no transitional forms. Evolution is still soundly supported by biology, by genetic information, by cosmological information. All of the fields of science unanimously agree and support it. So even if there was not a single fossil on this planet, it wouldn't matter. And we are all only this year's model of humanity, and we are constantly changing. Okay, hold it. Can you just respond to that? And then we'll move on. Either of you. I already did respond to that just prior to what she said. Um, I, I, there was something else that I'd love to bring up uh, before Please do. we. Yeah, I, I'd like to bring something else up. <clears throat> Imagine you're walking down the beach and you see in the sand some ripples in the sand. And you conclude, you know, that, that's really interesting. I bet that the, the, the water and the wind made those ripples in the sand. But if you keep walking and you find in the sand etched, John loves Mary forever with a heart around it and an arrow through it, you would conclude, somebody must have written that. Why? Because it contains information. Nature can produce patterns. That happens all the time. But it cannot produce detailed, meaningful information. Now, you and I have something inside of our bodies called DNA. You have 10 trillion cells, and in those cells is DNA. DNA are microscopic strands containing digital information. If you connected all of your DNA strands together, they'd reach from the Earth to the Sun and back 66 times in your body and in mine. And that whole thing is packed with genetic, encoded digital information that is the instructions on how to make a nose, eyes, ears, teeth, skin, hair, bones, lungs, a heart, a stomach. How did the information get in there? By accident? Charles Darwin spoke of the simple cell, but that was so long ago, he didn't have the level of knowledge that we have now and couldn't see down to the DNA level where you have the enormous complexity and the very specific information. Remember, nature produces patterns, but not information. And if you do the research, you will find that any self-respecting molecular biologist would tell you no one has a clue how the human body could possibly build itself by an accidental process. You say, well, then why do so many people believe it? I'm hoping to answer that question for you tonight, um, at least from my perspective as a former atheist myself, if we have time. OK, great. Thank you very much. OK. Um, I just want to put one quick question to both of you before we go to audience questions because people are, you know, they've been incredibly patient. One of the arguments that Christians use is to say, okay, if you want evidence, what about the existence, the life, the birth, the death, and some would argue the resurrection of Christ himself? Oh boy. Was he not evidence that he existed? What about what he said? How do you deal with that? Um, okay, well, first of all, there's actually, actually no historical evidence that isn't a hotly disputed item within the field of history to prove that he ever was even a man, much less the son of God. No, I, I don't. With, with respect, I think. I'll explain no, it I, if you like. Okay. It's a hot button here. Yeah. Okay. If, if you like, I, I can. First of all, their, it, first century Palestine is a very well-recorded era of history. We've got dozens of historians who kept accurate and detailed records of hundreds of supposed savior gods. They were looming around every corner. Funny thing is, they never mentioned this Jesus. Even if there was a historical person that that story was based on, that it was mythologized out of, he could not possibly have gone into the temple at Jerusalem on Passover and started a riot without even being mentioned one time, not once, by a contemporaneous historian. 
you're looking earliest dating for anything about this guy to be a hundred years or so after his death? 60, 60, 60, 70. Can, can I just answer this? Sorry. Something yeah, that's please. not contested. Okay, Kelly, hold it. Go. That's Pray. just not true. Josephus spoke of Jesus very clearly. And it's a forgery. Contemporaneous. And, and not this. contemporaneous. Hey, one, one sec. Just let me you have got so much faith in history books. You quote history books like they're gospel, and you ignore the gospel records. Do you believe in George Washington? Hang on. Hang on. Just, just let him finish. Whenever you quote history books, it shows you've got blind faith in the words of man. We have the words of the living God in the Bible. The Bible has substantiated itself to be God's word by just open study. You can look at me while I'm speaking to you guys. Don't look away. Just have to open the Bible and read it. It's self-proval. It's axiomatic. It's full of I've read it multiple prophecies. Times. The Bible is full of prophecies that are coming true in our day and age. It's the world's most famous and greatest seller of all time. It speaks history into existence before it happened. Read the words of Jesus in Matthew 24 or Luke 21. Study the scientific facts in the Bible. It says in Job, the earth hangs upon nothing. When science believed it sat on the back of three, two gigantic tortoises. It speaks of the, not only the earth's free float in space, but it speaks of other scientific facts in Isaiah about the world being spherical. Just take the time to read it. It's self-provable as God's word. It's got a finger it. all over it. We've both read the Bible multiple times. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we're going we're gonna to move on now to questions from the audience. And as some of you will know, we've actually been inviting questions via our website. And I want to begin by putting a question to Kirk and Ray, which came from somebody called Alan Ewan from here in New York. And he'd like us to ask you this question. He writes, if God is the creator of all things, seen and unseen, then is evil not also his creation? Yeah, it's, it, it's a good question. Um, darkness is the absence of light. That's what darkness is. You remove light and you have darkness. Evil is the absence of good. If you remove evil, sorry, you remove good, then you naturally get evil. So yeah, God created all things, but you cannot attribute the character of God to being evil because there is such a thing as evil. That's why, his insinuation. Why? why not? Because God is righteous and holy and perfect. There is no sin in God. The Bible says he is light and in him is no darkness at all. But you seem to be suggesting or agreeing that actually he did create both good and evil. Yeah, he created light and darkness. Darkness is the absence of light and evil is the absence of good. But as of the insinuation from an atheist or a skeptic is that God is evil, he created evil, therefore God is evil. That's not true. Okay, Kirk, do you want to add to that? O only to add that, that man is culpable for his own rebellion against God. That God has created us with the capacity uh, in the beginning to love him, to obey him, or to reject that and um, uh, rebel against him. And so to say that sort of the God, ma you know, God made me do it sort of response is just not going to hold up because we're all mor morally culpable people. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, does anyone have a question in the audience for Brian and Kelly? This gentleman there. Brian, you stated that uh, you don't need to be religious or have a religion to be good. But looking at the test tube of history, if we want to look at com uh, atheistic nations, we have some ready-made experiments in the form of communist nations. And we find from communist nations that they killed off approximately 100 million of their own people. Is this a good example of atheists being good? Yeah, actually, Kelly's going to take this one. This is her area of expertise. Okay. okay well, first of all, um, the test tube of history that you're using in includes a very small sample you are more than likely specifically referring to Stalinist Russia and Hitler's Germany. Many other communist um, nations. Pol Pot, uh, you know, Mao, yeah. Yes. Ceausescu, Take various. Of them. The, 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 there, there's but a these, aren't crimes, yeah, it, it, these aren't crimes committed in the, in the name of atheism. What other examples do you have of atheistic countries that you could use to demonstrate that atheists can be good? Sweden, well, look at Norway. Atheist nations these today. are not atheist countries. These are traditional Sweden is 80 percent. 80 percent of the people in Sweden understand the theory of evolution as a fact. Uh, they're very atheism, successful. Atheism, please. Not yeah. Theory of evolution. I, I believe it's 90 percent of the people in Sweden are atheistic. 
the, the United States is the most religious country in the world, and we have more violence than any other country in the world. Can I just, though, take that gentleman's question and, and put it to you in a slightly different way? He, he's asking you to give him an example of where the absence of religious faith, the absolute absence of religious faith, has produced a value system that has been for the benefit of all the people. Well, religion is something that has been with humanity for thousands of years. So I don't think that there has been an experiment of an entire nation with absolutely no religion exactly, there has ever. But communism is not the appropriate analogy because communism is a form of state worship. There might not be a god because your god is the state. They weren't trying to put forward any kind of value. Okay, thank you. Hold it there. I, I now want to throw the, the floor open to any questions you might have for Ray and Kirk. This gentleman at the front, please. In response to the cultural context uh, comment that they made about your religion, depending on your cultural context, you said that the gospel is preached everywhere. I wonder about people who lived in the native, uh, people who were Native Americans before Columbus, people who were aboriginals before the Dutch discovered Australia, people in sub-Saharan Africa before Christian missionaries reached there, people in present-day Saudi Arabia who are forbidden at the pain of death from speaking to a Christian or even having a Christian cross, how do they, or how did they, receive the word of Jesus? Thank you. It's important to realize that God won't judge people because they haven't heard the gospel. God will judge people for murder, for rape, for cannibalism, for lying and stealing. That's what sin is. It's not failing to hear the gospel. So the fact you live in the hard, deepest Africa doesn't mean that you're going to be free on Judgment Day. The only one that can save you is the Savior. There's no other name under heaven. That's why missionaries like David Livingston risked their lives and went to the heart of Africa to take the gospel because the gospel provides a Savior for humanity. We can be saved from God's wrath on Judgment Day through trusting in Him. But here's the point that this gentleman's making. You live in a cultural context like Saudi Arabia or in another severely Islamic environment where actually adhering to any kind of other faith can result in your own death. What hope is there? Well, but, but that was the case with early Christianity. Um, that was the case with those who lost their lives by proclaiming what they knew to be true because of the radical nature of the conversion of the human being who encountered the living Christ. They were put to death often for their faith. And there are countries like that today. And that is love demonstrated very clearly when you see missionaries going into places like this, bringing the gospel to them for no other reason than that they know it's true and they care about these people. And that testifies to the reality of the gospel and of the power of the Holy Spirit, that they will go in there and they'll do that. Okay, another question that uh, I wanted to put to you Brian and Kelly, came from somebody called Kimball of Omaha, Nebraska, who asked this question. And this question was actually repeated by about five or six emails, individuals, different parts of the country. What if you're wrong and God does exist? Which oh, one? Oh, Pascal's wager. Yay! Which God? Well, let's, for the sake of this argument, say the Christian God exists. What if you're wrong? Uh, then we go to hell. And your reflection on that? It's obvious when you read the Bible that that God does not exist. So, I mean, if I were to live my life just being scared of that God and do all of the things that Kirk and Ray do throughout their life, I sacrifice the only life I get to enjoy it the way that I should, using my mind, logic, and reason to get through life. Kelly? Um, yeah, my response to that would be that I would rather go to hell than go to heaven and worship a megalomaniacal tyrant. Okay. Does anyone have a question for Brian and Kelly? Uh, the lady at the back. I'm going to keep this short and sweet because this is a huge topic and I want to bring it back to the issue of science and faith. 
You gave us an example of the perfection of creation and therefore the existence of God, your eyes, your nose, your mouth. Then how do you explain cancer? That's a very good question and the issue of suffering is one that, that concerns all of us. And, no, um, cancer, yeah, not suffering. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. Um, firstly, I never use the word perfection of creation. It's very important to understand that the Bible says we live in a fallen creation. We don't have just, not only have kids in, with cancer, we have 40,000 children every 24 hours die of starvation. We have cancerous diseases throughout this nation. We have earthquakes that crush families and their homes. People get struck by lightning. I mean, suffering is all around us. No, it, sir, excuse me. I have to, I'm going to, I'm going to force this, this issue. You gave an example of your eyes, your nose, your mouth, about, and, and you, you want, the point of that was that we are supposed to believe that the Lord created this perfect machine. Man. Now, this perfect machine often goes very wrong. Yeah, I'd like you not to butt in again because it's very important I keep my train of thought, okay? Because I'm trying to answer your question. I want to be respectful. It's a very important question, question the issue of suffering. All around us we see suffering. <laughs> so, okay, I'll say cancer. All around us we have things like cancer. We have cancer of all different sorts. Children get cancer. Why does God allow suffering? Here is the answer. The Bible tells us we live in a fallen creation. In the beginning, God created everything perfect. No disease, no cancer, no suffering, no death. As by the sin of one man, or death entered the world, death passed on all men, the Bible says, because all have sinned. So don't use suffering as an excuse to reject God because it's a very real reason to accept Him because the Bible tells us why we have suffering. We live in a fallen creation. It's very, very clear. Okay, thank you. Let's... Just a, one, one final question, one final question from the floor for Brian and Kelly before we up some. Okay, there's a gentleman right at the back. Uh, Kelly, I believe, questioned the existence of Jesus Christ as a man, and I've done a lot of research in this area and have discovered that indeed, not only did Jesus Christ exist, but there is evidence of the Last Supper and that Jesus at the Last Supper, which was a Passover Seder got up and said Thomas you will doubt me Peter you will deny me Judas you will betray me waiter separate checks <laughs> sorry this this gentleman here with the spectacles <laughs> a, a, a question for Brian and Kelly the question is something that we can overlook we're using one thing that we have and we never question it. We're using applied logic. We're, we're using these very abstract ideas. Um, and, the, and the question, if God is the ultimate autonomous being, and the, there was a, 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 an issue raised about in different cultures, we tend to project God. We project God out of our existence. Uh, if God is the ultimate being, can't it just be said that you are simply projecting the self as God. Now, that's becoming, that's just a, another pro, uh, projection as much as people in different cultures who project or you to use your very well made point. Um, and wouldn't that just make it a moot point? Or wouldn't just invalidate your point about God is just a projection of whatever we experience? Might that not better render the idea that God exists and we simply respond to him? Thank you. Um, well, I, I think that was actually uh, Martin's point about the projection in yeah. different Yeah, he, he raised a very good, no, good but he, point. He's asking you the point. Yeah, it, at any rate. Um, the difference between that and God is that I know I exist. Even if we lived in some kind of other universe, maybe if it's all inside of a dream of some other thing, in that setting, I exist to myself. This God that you want to attribute all of that to, there's no evidence for him. If there were evidence for him, if it was self-evident, then you know I, I would believe it, but it's just not. I'm sorry, I just need to touch on the point, the question that was asked of us earlier. I feel like we were short on time. 
Um, and I'm going to read directly from page 43 of Letter to a Christian Nation of Sam Harris, who quotes the United uh, Nations Human Development Report. He says, Norway, Iceland, Australia, Canada, Sweden, Switzerland, Belgium, Japan, the Netherlands, Denmark, and the United Kingdom are among the least religious societies on earth, according to the, the report. They are also the healthiest, as indicated by life expectancy, adult literacy, per capita income, educational attainment, gender equality, homicide rate, and infant mortality. And then just another point um, in reference to the United States being one of the most religious societies on earth, we are uniquely believed, beleaguered by high rates of homicide, abortion, teen pregnancy, sexually transmitted disease, and infant mortality. And there's a lot more there. Okay, thank you. Okay. You, just, you can respond to that, but then we got to move on. Yeah, I, just, I, I, I think that those quotes are interesting from Sam Harris, but that doesn't prove that God doesn't exist because there are countries who don't believe. We're now going to have just a brief period for some closing remarks, and I'm going to have to be fairly severe because of our time constraints. So, Ray, would you like to just give us two minutes of some closing thoughts before I shut down the debate? Here's my, my closing thought, and, and that is, imagine if a man was transported from 100 years ago into your living room. He stands there on the corner, he says, what's this box doing here? And you say, oh, that's a television set. He's tapping on it, say, uh, what does it do? So well, a, a guy comes on and reads the news to me, up-to-date news. He says, how does he get in the box? So uh, he's not in the box. The guy says, is he in the box or is me? He says, well, his image is in the box. A signal, a, a television signal is sent through the air until it gets to my house where there's a disc, a satellite disc, a, and a dish, and it comes through a cable and into the set, and he manifests. A guy taps the screen for a minute and says, what are you talking about? You're saying that some invisible newsreader goes through the air, floats through the air invisibly, gets to a dish on your roof, comes down the dish, through a cable, and comes up into the box. What are you talking? You think I'm a fool? But there's an air of confidence in your voice. You said, give me the remote and push that power switch and you'll see it happen. And I know what we're saying sounds fantastic in the truest sense of the word. We're saying the invisible God that you cannot see will manifest himself to you if you push the button. That's all you have to do. There's a challenge for you. Push the button. It's called repentance and faith. Be honest. Realize you've sinned against God. Look at the commandments. Understand that God made, made provision for you to have everlasting life. Push that button. That's all you have to do. Repent and trust the Savior, and God will manifest himself to you, transform you on the inside, give you a new heart with new desires so that you will love that which is right, and that's a miracle when it happens to you. But perhaps you have an ulterior motive. Perhaps that you, it's not that you can't find God, but it's that you won't find God. You don't want to, as the Bible says. Okay, thank you very much. Because we're short on time, we're going to go with me first, and if you don't have enough, then... No, I have plenty for you. Okay. Brian. Uh, well, you know, way of the master is right. Religion is a force for good. When you take out the murder, mass genocide committed by God as documented in the Bible, religious wars, burning witches at the stake... Ted Haggard, shooting abortion doctors, the Bible's promotion of slavery, pedophile priests, serial killing Christians gone wild, the church's systematic oppression of women and minorities, aversion to protection against STDs and the spread of AIDS in third world countries, creative and inconsistent interpretation of thou shalt not kill. Take it all out, religion is a force for good. Re <laughs> Ray says we all have a conscience. Did his God forget to give a conscience to, to Saddam Hussein, Adolf Hitler, the popes who have the blood of millions on their hands, and Osama bin Laden? And on Osama bin Laden, do you know what the definition of a terrorist is? Some definitions say terrorists use violence, but it can also be the threatened use of violence for the purpose of creating fear in order to achieve a religious goal. This is exactly what Ray and Kirk have been doing. They put the fear of God and hell into non-believers. What could be more terroristic than believe this or burn for an eternity? The answer is nothing. Not many acts of terrorism are also fueled by its worst victims, so I don't entirely fault Ray and Kirk. I understand their intent is based on their fear of hell. Look, enough is enough. It's time for people of re reason to unite and help others abandon this fear that has been brainwashed into them from birth. Ray and Kirk teach our children to believe from birth, yet they can't defend their views of God logically. We, as a society, are mentally abusing our children if we're teaching them how to be illogical. 
If you are emotionally charged by what Kelly and I have been saying up here tonight, it is entirely possible that you are one of religion's victims. You can help yourself today. You can abandon your indefendable religious beliefs today and embrace a logical worldview predicated on evidence, logic, and reason. Abandon your guilt and fear, fear and you'll feel, feel better for it. I promise you, you will not burn in any hell that man has created to scare you into belief. Okay, thank you. I'd, I'd finally like to ask Kirk just to say a few words. We often receive emails from people, um, atheists in particular, saying, you know, you guys, you, you, you guys who believe in God are idiots. You're small-minded people who are unintelligent. You don't think. Well, I just want to read a short list of some of our idiots who believe in God. Albert Einstein. Galileo. We... Just let him, let him, let him pa finish. Pardon me, I didn't say he was a Christian. Albert Einstein, Galileo, Shakespeare, Sir Isaac Newton, Copernicus. These guys were not stupid. When it comes to intelligence, the side of creationism has got it in spades. And the science is good, and the logic is good. Now, we're not up here saying that we think atheists are unintelligent. There are a lot of smart atheists. Sam Harris and Richard Dawkins are clearly intelligent men. That's not the problem. If someone insists there is no God when creation clearly demonstrates that there is a creator, the problem is not an intellectual one. It is a moral one. It is not the problem that you can't find God, it's that you won't find God. It's a matter of the will. I want to quote Richard Dawkins, who wrote The God Delusion. He said, even if there was no actual evidence in favor of the Darwinian theory, we should still be justified in preferring it over all rival theories. Did you hear that? He said, even if there is no actual evidence, we should still believe it over the other theories. Even in light of what can be presented to justify those theories. That is unreasonable, and it's unscientific. That is the definition of blind faith. I believe something even though there is no evidence to support it. Why would anybody do that? Well, here's my opinion. I think if you admit that there is a God, then you willingly put yourself under his authority. And now you're not in charge. Many atheists that I know, they just flat out don't want anyone telling them what they can and cannot do morally. That is anathema to them, especially somebody who is all-powerful, created everything, and has rules and consequences for violating those rules. They reject the whole concept and start with the presupposition that there is therefore no God, and they ignore the evidence that supports the existence of God, and they pick the ones that they want to support their theory. How do I know this? That's what I used to do as an atheist. So at the end of the day, it comes down to this. You've heard both sides of the argument. You have to make a decision about what you believe about God. It's the biggest decision you'll ever make in your life. God will reveal himself to you, not just generally, but very specifically and purposefully to you if you will respond to creation, if you will respond to your own conscience and to the gospel. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay, we can just... Do you want to just say a final word, Kelly? Sure. Um, I, I think everybody here can tell that there was not one piece of evidence presented at all for their God. <laughs> and it, it, it's really ironic that the worst charge that they can level against us is that we use faith to support our, wor our worldview, which isn't true but it's exactly what they do. So why is that a problem? It's okay for you. Why isn't it okay for me? It, it's just silly. Their whole appeal to authority fallacy there at the end, oh, all of these smart people believe in God. We never said that there are not intelligent people who believe in God. They clearly are. But they do this thing called compartmentalization. Everywhere else in my life, I'm logical and rational. Just this one little spot, my little God box in my brain, I won't let my logic seep into there. 
So, the, I mean, essentially, there's, there has been nothing presented today as any kind of evidence. It's just an appeal to your emotions and your fear of death and fear of punishment to believe in their God. And I'm sorry that that's all we got today. Okay. Thank you. I just... We're, 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 going, we're going to end in a moment, and I've just got to close the piece. But I just wanted to ask you, Ray, um, that was a pretty strong accusation that all you gave was a sense of guilt, fear about the afterlife, fear of judgment. I d is that what you wanted to do? Is that what you no, wanted to No, that's not the message we gave. Every single person has a fear of death, every single one of us. Instead of calling the fear of death, call it a will to live. And as I said, if there's one chance in a million that what we're saying is true, soften your heart. Pray. Listen to the voice of your conscience. Look at the genius of God's hand through creation. The Bible says, if you seek God, you will surely find him if you seek him with your whole heart. If you wanted an interview with the Queen of England, you can't say, Queen, come and see me. You've got to bow to the standard that she has to go and see her. You may have to change your clothes, clean yourself up, humble yourself. Well, God says he resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. And the only way you can approach God is with a humble heart. And if you do that, you'll find him as surely as Kirk and I found him and millions of others throughout contemporary society and down through history have found God to be true to his promises. Okay, so let's you. all humble our hearts and pray to Poseidon. And that just about rounds up our first Nightline face-off debate. I hope you found it interesting and enlightening. I'd like to thank our panelists, Ray Comfort and Kirk Cameron. And Brian Sapient and Kelly. I'd also like to thank our audience for their contribution and those of you who contributed online. A distilled version of this debate will be broadcast during tonight's television edition of Nightline. That's on ABC at 11.35 Eastern Time. I hope you'll join us. But for now, for all of us at Calvary Baptist Church in New York, it's goodbye and thank you for joining us.